And next week, President Biden will welcome governors from both parties to Washington, D.C. for the NGA's winter meeting. New Jersey Governor and National Governors Association Chair Phil Murphy is set to attend. He'll have plenty to discuss with the president, including three tough races, election races, taking place later this year. I spoke with Governor Murphy earlier about those elections, his conversations with the president, and much more. Governor Phil Murphy, chair of the National Governors Association, and sir, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Um, I, I wanted to actually start with your role leading the National Governors Association. Tell us a little bit about what uh, your priorities will be as you take over this position. Yeah, good to be with you, Eamon. The, the NGA is, I think, one of the few bipartisan organizations that actually get stuff done. And I can give you a bunch of examples, but, uh, but one I think embodies this. When you're the chair, you get to pick an initiative that, that is supported by both sides of the aisle. And I became chair last July, and the initiative I chose was to strengthen me mental health among our young people uh, with broad support across the country from governors in all, all corners. And you go around the country during the year of your chairmanship and you convene experts and other governors, stakeholders, and supporters to try to develop uh, a playbook. And, and next July, we'll end up in Atlantic City, New Jersey, and we will have, God willing, a playbook for all states to feed off of in terms of how to deal with strengthening the mental health of our kids, which have been so impaired over the past several years. So that's one example of many I could give you. Yeah, and a very important one. And I also know that you're the chair of the Democratic Governors Association um, and have a role in the elections on that front. Um, you know, there are three major gubernatorial elections this year. Two of those seats are currently held by Democrats. I know you have spoken about Governor Andy Beshear in Kentucky uh, being one of the top priorities for you. Talk about what you're hoping to do to get him reelected in this traditionally very red state. Yeah, so we've got three states up, Kentucky, Louisiana, and Mississippi. Andy Bashir in his reelection in Kentucky is priority number one. He's done a, an amazing job. He is broadly supported, including by a good chunk of Republicans. And I think the reason is he's focused on issues that matter in Kentucky, kitchen table issues. You look at the jobs he's brought. Ford Motor Company, a great example. Uh, so real focus on kitchen table, job creation, taking care of working families. He's also had to deal with some awful natural disasters, uh, tornadoes, flooding, and he's been masterful in the, in the face of real challenges. John Bell Edwards in Louisiana is a great governor, but he's term limited. So we're, we're, we're in the process of finding somebody to step into his shoes. That'll be, that won't be easy, uh, but that's a state we've proven as a party we can win. And I think we've got a real shot. The sleeper for me is Mississippi, a very unpopular governor. Our candidate is likely to be Brandon Presley, Elvis's cousin, statewide elected, a, a guy with a lot of credentials uh, who speaks again to that kitchen table. So it's going to be an exciting year. We'll be playing aggressively in all three of those states. And, of course, part of your role as the National Governors Association chair is uh, as a conduit, if you will, between the White House and the governors of this country. You're set to meet with President Biden at the White House next week. What are you hoping to come out of that event? I'm very excited about this. This is our, our annual winter meeting. Uh, it's been a little bit uh, sideways the past several years because of the pandemic, but this is finally we're full on several days of meetings, including a half a day with senior cabinet officials and other senior administration officials in the White House, dinner with the president and vice president uh, and their first lady and second gentleman. Uh, listen, the president understands uh, government probably unlike perhaps anybody else in this country. Uh, and while he was not a governor, uh, he's lived uh, in, in our shoes in so many other respects. In fact, I was just with him uh, this past week uh, with Governor Hochul in New York, kicking off a huge piece of the Hudson Tunnel projects that will uh, finally update uh, the, the tunnels under the Hudson River. Uh, he's a guy who cares deeply. Uh, he understands that governors really matter. It's not either or federal government or governors, but it's and both. 
He's been an incredible partner and as his administration over the past couple of years. So much of what has gone through Congress that he signed has huge positive impact on states. So it's going to be a chance, I think, to both acknowledge, celebrate on the one hand, but also acknowledge we have a lot more work to do as a right. country and as governors. Let's talk a little bit about uh, your state, the great state of New Jersey. Uh, this week, a federal judge blocked part of your state's new gun carry law from being enforced effectively, temporarily at least, lifting the blanket prohibition on carrying guns in uh, public parks or beaches and casinos. Give me a reaction to that. Is your administration prepared to fight this ruling? Very much so. My reaction would be not happy, but not surprised. Uh, we respect the judiciary. We don't agree with the conclusion, uh, and we will fight it, I promise you. You know, this is the concealed carry law uh, that we very carefully structured with our legislature so that it fit into a U.S. Supreme Court ruling, which, by the way, we also don't agree with, but we accept that it's the law of the land. Uh, I remain optimistic, uh, and I'm happy to say uh, that every casino in our state has affirmatively said they will communicate uh, that guns are not allowed on their premises, which you're allowed to do, by the way. If you can, if it's a private property, you can com communicate through signage, through other forms of communication. Uh, so if you're a casino, a bar, a restaurant, notwithstanding an adverse uh, opinion from the federal bench, uh, you can still take your own steps to keep guns off, off your premises. Of course, um, America is still reeling from the death of Tyree Nichols, uh, another killing of a black man at the hands of police. Uh, talk about the reforms that you have passed to tackle police use of force in your state and whether or not there is anything that can be learned from that experience nationwide. Yeah, I mean, we've done a lot. And, and I've said a lot since this awful, ugly tragedy. Tyree Nichols should be alive and well as we, as we speak here. Um, that at every tragic uh, uh, moment like this, we've looked in the mirror and asked ourselves, can we learn? Can we be better? And we spent an enormous amount of time and energy on deepening the relations between law enforcement on the one hand and the communities they serve on the other. So we were early on body cameras. Uh, we now require members of law enforcement to be licensed. We have an independent prosecutor uh, law that I signed, meaning if there's a shooting uh, in some form involving a law enforcement officer or if there's a death of any kind, that automatically gets independently uh, reviewed and it must end up in a grand jury. Uh, we put out some very explicit uh, guidance on use of force and updated that for the first time in decades. Um, so we've taken a whole lot of steps. Uh, we're, we're not perfect. We remain on a journey. Uh, but as you rightfully point out, when you see something awful like this, you got to look in the mirror and ask yourself, are there other steps you could take? And we're doing that right now. Let me get your thoughts on um, what is happening down south in Florida. This week, the College Board announced that it had, in effect, watered down an advanced placement African-American studies course. Uh, it came after the course was criticized by another governor, Republican Governor Ron DeSantis of Florida, who seems to be really doubling down on a lot of these culture war issues in this country. What do you make of this move? What do you think about this debate that's raging around African-American studies uh, in high schools? So first of all, the college board got rolled. There's no other way to put it. Uh, I, I'm a former ambassador, former diplomat. I'd like to be more diplomatic, but they got rolled. And I think it's outrageous. Uh, and, you know, Governor DeSantis, I'm, I'm sure others are, you know, tr trying to go down paths that all they do is divide us. All, all the, all, the only thing that will come out of this is, is, is division. And apparently he thinks that's a smart political playbook. I, I take a different uh, tack. We're actually expanding dramatically our, our African-American AP curriculum in New Jersey. Um, we, we believe that our history ought to be told to our kids, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Most of it's good, by the way. Uh, you know, we're proud to have that flag behind us. Uh, we're, we're proud to live in the greatest nation on earth. But as President Obama used to say, we wake up every morning trying to perfect our union, recognizing we're not perfect. Our history is not perfect. New Jersey's history, as it relates to slavery, is particularly imperfect. 
Our kids need to know that. And I think we're a stronger nation and we're stronger as individuals if we've got all the facts. And that's the side of history that we're on. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. The more we know, the better we will be as a country. Let me stay on the education front for a moment because you recently signed into law uh, a bill requiring public schools in New Jersey to teach media literacy to uh, K through 12 students. Uh, that's pretty interesting. What, what do you hope to achieve with this? Yeah, I think it's, Eamon, I think it's the first in the nation. Um, and we're r really proud of that. There's a nonprofit ci civics association, which I think is also it's only of its kind in the nation, which I want to give a lot of credit to. The, the, the really good thing about that bill that I signed, and I think this is a statement about the fact that we actually can still come together as a country, is it was bipartisan uh, sponsored and supported, which I think is a really important point. Because when you hear media literacy, uh, you probably folks default to, well, that's one side of the aisle calling out fake news. Uh, it was actually right. both sides of the aisle acknowledging that in this, these fraught times in our nation, it's really important, again, that our kids understand uh, that they, they, they need to parse the real from the fake. And they need to understand uh, that, you know, this is the information coming at them. They've got to have the skills to, to be able to, to as, I, as I say, to parse that from the, 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 the good from the bad, not necessarily good in the sense that they want to hear it, but accurate. And, and I'm really proud that we signed this and, and our districts now are putting their pen, pen to paper in terms of what that curriculum around the state will look like. Uh, and, and I think it's a really good thing. And I'm, again, particularly happy it was bipartisan supported. Yeah, again, as somebody who works in media, I think this is a great initiative and, uh, and wish your state and everyone involved in it the best of luck. This country definitely needs more uh, media literacy. Um, Governor Phil Murphy of New Jersey, uh, sir, thank you so much for your time. I greatly appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Eamon.